Hello everyone, this is Paul Maluthnock, uh, studying chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. And this is part two of this uh, study. We're going to start here with verse 11. We left off on part one with verse 10. And so please uh, uh, study this uh, with me and, uh, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in. Let's look at uh, verse 11 on. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. We talked a little bit last time about this mortal wound, and I gave you uh, three possibilities of it. So in this second half of the chapter, uh, which uh, presents to us a portrait of the final false prophet, the final false prophet, the most uh, interpreters who see this first beast as an individual also see the second beast as also an individual. It's a person. Uh, others who see the first beast as a power or a movement, tend to view the second beast similarly. Many of the reformers identified the second beast as the, the Pope or the papacy. Uh, but again, I believe these are both individuals and they're both used by Satan. Uh, many modern interpreters view the first beast as a personification of secular power in opposition to the church and the second beast as the personification of false religion. However, it seems to take these beasts as representing individuals, as I've mentioned. And, and when it says, and I saw, marks another new scene in the vision that John has been observing since uh, chapter 12, verse one. John saw another beast rise to prominence out of the earth the Greek word translated earth refers to the land in contrast to the sea. In the minds of the ancients, none of the terrestrial anime, animals could compare in magnitude with the monsters of the deep. So coming out of the earth in itself indicates a degree of inferiority in power of the second beast to the first beast. If the sea represents the abyss, the earth probably represents planet earth. Clearly the second beast is a servant of the dragon, but his connections with the dragon are not as obvious as those of the first beast. His two horns may symbolize some political power, but less power, less power than the first beast in particular. Probably uh, in his external conduct, the second beast was more peaceful as a lamb. So we think about these, these uh, little horns. We think about them as little, uh, very small horns, just protruding out of the head, kind of like a little lamb. But his words, well, they'll prove satanic. His words reveal true loyalty to the dragon. He is the false prophet. The second beast will represent the first beast by acting as his prophet. He will be effective, uh, an agent in directing the persecution of believers. He will lead the worship of the first beef beast, uh, evidently as the leader of a worldwide religious movement. This is a satanic counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. You could see where uh, more parallels again to God, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This reference to the first beast's fatal wound being healed also highlights the comparison with Christ who rose from the dead. In Matthew chapter 24, there's some familiar words from the Lord himself, because he said, for many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. So again, predicting the same kind of proliferation at the uh, end time in Mark 13, 
Scripture says that Jesus spoke and said, false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders in order, if possible, to lead the elect astray. So the Antichrist not only has the devil and his hellish demons, he's not only the accumulated powers of all demonic and human sovereignties, he not only has control of the governments of the globe, but he also has a potent companion who promotes his power and aids him greatly by swaying the hearts of people into satanic religion. His aid will be religious. It will be spiritual. He will cause the world to worship the Antichrist as if it were God. So his power will not just be the power that's in political, or military, or economic. He will have the great religious power because the false prophet will convince the world that this Antichrist is God and is the only hope of salvation. And this, this crushing, crumbling world that is going to, to, to buy this in the tribulation, and they will buy the lie of the false prophet. They will bow down and worship the Antichrist as if he were God, and they will be destroyed and be damned with him. In Matthew 24, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to the point to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them. He said, you see all these, uh, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, I think he was referring to the 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the temple. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, it says, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall. They'll fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved, or you could say it is saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand this. I think that those scriptures from Jesus are very important to this and very relevant. It's the reason I, I read them. And the work of the false prophet is critical to the effort of Satan because the power of religion over men's minds is so great. I think any of us knows anything about man and how he operates from a historic viewpoint you must understand that man does not live without some transcendent belief system, something bigger than themselves. It is built into the very fabric of man's life to believe in some transcendent power that's beyond themselves. Some faith exists in all men, faith in the supernatural, faith in the mystical, faith in the psychic, faith in something that's divine or something that's invisible, or faith in our true God. The false prophet will come along as the greatest preacher, the greatest false preacher the world has ever known. And you've heard great preachers before, gifted preachers, orators. The world has known many of them through its history, but nothing like this. And he is so powerful that his preaching sways the entire world. True or false, human nature uh, must have a religion. Man is an incurable worshiper. 
He needs someone beyond himself to believe in. And if he can't identify uh, who it is, even if it's something nebulous, and he gives it somewhat uh, a weird name, but in this case, there'll be nothing nebulous about his worship. It'll be attached to a human being who was in dealt by a formidable demon right out of the pit itself. The Antichrist, who then opposes God, who himself declares that he is above everything and everyone who is called God, and demands that the world worship him. We will find that that's indeed what will be accomplished through the agency of the false prophet. So, the false prophet then leads the world into this final world of religion, which is the worship of the Antichrist, to the very end. John Phillips, um, writing in the book of Revelation, says, the dynamic appeal of a false prophet will lie in his skill in combining political expediency with the religious passion. His arguments will be subtle, convincing, and appealing. His, his oratory will be hypnotic, for he is able to move the masses to tears or whip them into a frenzy. He will control the communication media of the world and will skillfully organize mass publicity to promote his end. He will manage and message his message uh, with guile beyond words. He will mold world thought and shape human opinion just like pottery for clay. And Revelation 17 makes it clear that a worldwide form of universal religion is going to take shape in the end, end times. So if you look over at Revelation 17, starting verse 1, you can flow right down through verse 9, and you see described there's a worldwide system of religion. It's very clearly defined there. Now, the second beast here is the false prophet. Not in this chapter, but in three other places in Revelation. Revelation chapter 16, uh, he is called the false prophet. Revelation 19 and Revelation 20. So here it hasn't been called the false prophet yet, but he will. In all three of those other scriptures and future scriptures, uh, he's identified as the false prophet. His purpose is to direct the attention of the world towards the Antichrist and cause the whole world to worship him. He does that amazingly by the power of Satan, and he is successful. He will be a religious preacher, convincing the world to worship the Antichrist. Such a partnership between the sheer political power and religion is not new. In the days of Pharaoh, for example, we think of Pharaoh as, as the great world power. But remember when Moses and Aaron stood besides Pharaoh, the head of Egypt, he called in two magical priests by the name of Janes and Jambres, religionists of his empire. He asked them to oppose the God of the Israelites. He was a pagan king with great political and military might who had brought alongside with those kinds of people who, uh, by their signs and wonders and their mystical powers, could sway the hearts of women and men. The woman. The woman sits on the beast. The woman is the harlot. And there's a sense in which you have the beast who is raw political power. After riding the beast is this religious system. Now, what uh, that leads us to believe is that these two things will coexist. There will be a developing of an amassing of power of Antichrist and the military, economic, and the military side of it, uh, along with the political side of it. But riding along with this false religious system, so what you have is Antichrist gaining his power through the military, the political, uh, and then the false prophet gathering his power through the false religious system. So they'll coexist for a while, and uh, you go to the end of the chapter 17 for a moment, and you'll see it says, the waters where the harlot sits are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. The 10 horns which you saw in the beast, these will, uh, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. So what's going on here? The beast on whose back 
the false religious system is riding, all of a sudden rises up and destroys the false religious system. That's the picture here, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose. In other words, the things which were two, that is the Antichrist, and then you had uh, the false prophet uh, become one, and uh, the pro false prophet uh, goes away. So the Antichrist rises up, destroys the false religious system, and now they have common purpose. Now they give over their kingdom to the beast. So in the end, the people who were, who were worshiping and all of that uh, through that religious system is left to worship the Antichrist alone. And that's how it's going to start. World religion will develop around some other mystical, supernatural, uh, demonic system that will pull the world together. And they'll worship in a way that's not... Uh, yet the worship of the Antichrist until some point when the Antichrist rises up, destroys that system, and makes the world worship him. That's what Daniel uh, calls and what Jesus referred to the abomination of desolation that happens three and a half years into that great uh, tribulation. There comes a point when the false world religion is destroyed in favor of worshiping only the Antichrist and Antichrist alone. He will be at that point having risen to power by the middle of the week, middle of the seven years. So politics and religion start out separate and then they ultimately unite. To borrow the words of Jesus, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And the final kingdom of Satan will not be divided against itself. It will unite in a final form, both political and religion, and Satan's last effort to establish his kingdom on earth and prevent the Lord Jesus Christ from setting up his own. Now, back to the book of Revelation. The worship of the Antichrist with the aid of the false prophet then becomes the central focus here in the world. And if you look at chapter 14 and verse 9, you read, if anyone worships the beast in his image, he receives a mark on the forehead or on the hand. Verse 11 again talks about those who worship the beast in his image and receives the mark of his name. In chapter 15, verse 2, it talks about those who come off victorious from the beast and from his image and, and the number of his name. And you can see what happened as the whole world looks at nothing but the beast and his image. The beast and his image is it. And that's the image or the idol that replicates the Antichrist. That idol will be established right in Jerusalem and that will be the, the focal point of worship and he will be the only one worshipped. Now chapter 16, we'll see again in verse 2, where you have chosen the mark of the beast, and they worship the image. And you see again in chapter 19, verse 20, chapter 20, uh, there's only one individual worshipped out here on out. Now it's difficult to speculate um, any kind of success about who the false prophet will be. Some have suggested the false prophet might be a pope, uh, that's possible if it can have the kind of religious power, if it can, by the operation of demon through his own human ingenuity and cleverness and communication skill will sway the entire world. If a pope can be the one who orchestrates the world religion, it could be. On the other hand, it could be someone else. We can't be certain. It's interesting to note in Revelation 17 that a city of seven hills is identified as being the heart of the false religious system. I mentioned that earlier in part one. Throughout history, Rome has been known as such a city. The Antichrist is mysterious and dark and black and frightening and foreboding, but this man is a subtler, gentler, more domesticated individual. He's not so overpowering. He's not so frightening. He's not a terrorizing power like Antichrist, but rather he's winsome. He's persuasive. He's the epitome of the wolf in sheep's clothing. Some have suggested that maybe he's a Jew, but Jews aren't identified with the earth so much. They're identified with land, the land, but not the earth. That's a different word So, uh, in the Greek. So there's no reason to assume he will be a Jew in this particular point because he comes out of the earth. This could be a Jew, but it's not conclusive. It could be a Gentile. 
<clears throat> but the description of him gives us some somewhat subtle, gentle deception, uh, deceptiveness. Because notice the first beast was just plain scary. I mean, 10 horns, seven heads, 10 crowns, blasphemous names. He's like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. And he's got the power of a dragon. And, and he's got this mortal wound on one of his heads. Uh, it must be frightening to just think about that. But notice down in verse 11, the difference. The false prophet had two horns like a lamb, two little horns. Have you ever seen a, a little lamb sprout its horns, two little bumps? So he seems weaker than Antichrist, but still powerfully deceptive. He doesn't come like with power. Uh, the Antichrist comes fiercely, as like with those animals. But here he's just subtle. He's gentle in a sense which he could also be called Antichrist because uh, he is Antichrist and a pseudo-Christ masquerading as if he were a lamb. But the point of deception is to show the subtlety of his approach. He doesn't come raping and killing and devastating. He comes as a deceiver. He comes as a false lamb, gentle, comforting, tender, He's lending to the aid of the Antichrist. Here, Satan, in a sense, counterfeits Jesus Christ. This is the masterpiece of religious deception, the counterfeit of the true lamb. But when he opens his mouth, he gives himself away because he sounds like uh, the beast. He sounds like Satan. He exercises the same kind of demonic power, the same authority, He's empowered by the same source, obviously. Uh, while the Antichrist is Satan's false Christ, the prophet is Satan's false Holy Spirit. He's able to put together a world religion, uniting diverse systems into one. The house divided becomes united. It's a tremendous ability that lets this happen. Can you imagine creating a one world system with Buddhists, Muslims, and everyone else, Protestants, Catholics, and all that. Uh, that's impossible, but somehow he did it. And then he turns out uh, into a cult of the first beast. And verse 12 then says, he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. You see the little phrase in the middle of the verse, he makes. He makes could be translated, he causes. Uh, it is used eight times of him. He causes this to happen. Eight times he causes this to happen. He has tremendous world influence. Now, besides his great personal influence and persuasive speaking and uh, leadership ability, uh, his effort is aided by uh, an apparent, apparent uh, miracle. Notice uh, verse 12. He says he gets the whole world to worship uh, the beast because this fatal wound was healed. And in order to gain this credibility that the Antichrist wants, he's going to have to fabricate something uh, and, res and resurrect himself, just like the two witnesses. It just happened. To imitate the Lord himself, that's how it's going to have to happen. But uh, it seems to be too formidable, uh, formidable a task, but uh, apparently he gets this across to people. Let's look at verse 11. I mean, uh, verse 13, I'm sorry. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the sign, signs that it has allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Like Pharaoh's magicians, only with greater effectiveness, the second beast will have authority to perform supernatural miracles. These will be genuine signs and wonders, not just tricks. Like Elijah and the two witnesses, he will even be able to call down fire from heaven. John himself had one time wanted to do that. This power will make earth dwellers erroneously conclude that the authority is supreme. It's a deity. He will be able to produce sometimes of convincing likeness to the Antichrist, perhaps a statue 
or even an android of some kind. The false prophet will be the beast's minister of propaganda. The description of the first beast as having been fatal, wounded by the sword, and then having come back to life refers to his resuscitation or resurrection. Then notice verse 13. In addition to having the full authority of the Antichrist, functioning alongside the Antichrist, using the fabricated resurrection to draw attention to him as supernatural, he performs great signs. Verse 13, so that even makes fire come down out of heaven. He performs these great signs. Interesting. Little Greek phrase uh, that is used of Christ. Again, uh, he is counterfeiting Christ, but he performs great signs. When used of Christ, it is to describe our Lord's great miracles. And we see that in John 2, uh, 11 and 23, John 6, 2. It also mimics not only the Lord, but again, it mimics two witnesses back in chapter 11. Remember from verse 3, and following the two witnesses had the amazing ability to do things and fire come out their mouth. They had the power to shut up the sky for, uh, from the rain during the days of prophecy. They could even have power over the waters to turn them into blood. They could smite the earth with every plague that they desired. In 2 Thessalonians, again, it says, uh, it says his power and signs and wonders come with all the deception for wickedness for those who perish because they didn't love. They didn't receive the love of the truth of so as to be saved. Anyone rejecting the gospel, anyone who doesn't receive the truth is going to be deceived. They're going to be uh, believe whatever comes across. They're going to believe Antichrist is God. Indeed, he did rise from the dead. Indeed, these are powerful signs of supernatural strength and authority that we could put our trust in Antichrist. And he's going to deliver us for whatever is going on. Whatever terrible things are going to happen, Antichrist will deliver us. And that's what they'll believe. They'll all be blaspheming God of heaven, blaspheming God, cursing the God of heaven and putting their trust into Antichrist. Satan can do some pretty amazing things. He can do some supernatural works. If you go back and read Exodus chapter 7, uh, remind, remind again of Janies and Jambres. They're identified in 2 Timothy 3.8 and remind yourself of what the magicians did in Pharaoh's court. Pretty astounding. But the point is that Satan can fabricate supernatural signs, specifically ones of them that he does, this false prophet is identified here. He makes fire come down out to heaven. Apparently the Greek text would indicate a continually fire, something that goes on all the time. And he does it in the presence of men. Why? Because he wants to convince them of his power. He's trying to imitate the day of Pentecost. He's trying to imitate, imitate uh, Elijah. But more likely, he's going to imitate the witnesses out of whose mouth fire came. Let's look at verse 15. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who did not, who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both great and small, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead. This verse may mean that the second beast will give life to an inanimate object or that he will only appear to do so. In either case, he will deceive many people. Belief in statues which spoke and performed miracles is widely attested in ancient literature. The image will speak and, and put to death those who do not worship the beast, possibly issuing commands for execution. That's going to be weird. Evidently, these events will all take place in Jerusalem and probably in the temple uh, that will stand there at that time. Uh, we can't conclude that every believer uh, will die at this time, however. The second beast also implements the marking of the beast worshipers. We should probably interpret all to mean all classes of people, not every person. Uh, you know, but classes, social, economic, cultural, all those kind of things. 
Uh, these markings correspond among unbelievers to the sealing of God's servants in chapter 7. Remember the 144,000 that he sealed. They received a mark that uh, are willingly received. The choice of the right hand or forehead uh, is just for conspicuousness. Uh, it could not be hidden if it's on your arm or it's on your uh, head. It may be meant as a travesty to the Jewish custom of wearing those phylacteries, those little boxes, either on their head or on their arm. Uh, the mark of the beast is evidently a brand, kind of a mark, like a tattoo that identifies them as belonging to the Antichrist. Domestic slave owners sometimes branded their slaves with marks bearing their ownership. And the false prophet will not be just some guy who walks out in the desert or get off the latest bus, but he will be the most formidable religious ruler and leader on the face of the earth and great communicator. Between the two of them, what else, whatever else they could pull off, either supernaturally or by human genius, it will cause everybody on the whole world to be deceived. And in fact, they will erect an idol to the image of the beast and they will erect it in Jerusalem in defiance of the true God in Psalms 135, for verses 15 and 16, it says, The idol of the nations are but silver and gold for the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath at all in their mouths. The prophet Habakkuk uh, affirms the same thing, that an idol is a dumb thing that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake, and to a dumb stone, arise. There's no breath at all inside it. Why would you talk to a dumb rock or a dumb piece of wood? But contrary to what is normal, this idol can speak. Verse 15, and there was given to him a breath of the image of the beast, and the image of the beast might even speak. Now, this is pretty amazing. This powerful Antichrist, the world leader, will establish the focus of the world uh, to worship him. And the false prophet is somehow uh, given somehow the power to put breath in the very image of uh, this uh, statue. Notice that the word breath here, it's not uh, the word breath uh, that is true life. It's pneuma. And I think it means that it's an appearance of that phenomenon that looks like life. It's not bios and not zoe, but life. Uh, some would uh, like to say that this image comes to life, but I, I don't see where that's true. Satan's, Satan cannot give life. As I mentioned before in part one, he can, cannot bring something from inanimate to life or something dead to life. And so I don't, feel uh, this resurrection was probably more of a fabrication. And uh, speaking to the image is another one of Satan's deceptions. And if, if, remember, Pharaoh's magicians could do all those kind of things through some human ingenuity, then he might be able to do that also. And let's look at verse 17. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. Many believers will not take the mark of the beast. Perhaps they will be able to survive by pulling their resources, by obtaining the necessities of life in some other way, and through God's supernatural provisions. But those earth dwellers who worship the beast will accept his law and authority. Coins bore the image of the head and inscription of the emperor, and those who bear the mark of the beast demonstrate by this that they belong to him. When a person burned a pinch of incense to worship Caesar, he received a certificate verifying that he had done that. This preserved him from death by persecution, and enabled him to buy and sell. The mark of the beast appears to be a sort of a certificate of worship that a person can obtain 
by affirming his or her veneration to Antichrist. The interchangeability of the beast's name and the number of his name evidently indicates that the name written in letters has a numeric equivalent. Jesus indicated that it would take wisdom to figure out the number of the beast. The wisdom is the understanding and skill necessary to solve the problem. By identifying the beast's number, believers in the tribulation will be able to recognize him for who he is. Calculating or counting is the key to the puzzle, maybe. The number is 666, has of course been the subject of study by interpreters. Everyone's tried to figure this thing out. So it will be in that day. And anyone who doesn't comply, says verse 15, will be given a death sentence. And many who do not worship the beast are going to be killed. And we know this is going to happen. These executions will take place. There will be believers killed back in chapter 7. Remember reading about believers who will be executed by the faith, before their faith uh, in Jesus Christ. It must also be said and noted at this point that not all believers will be killed. The sentence of death will go out, but not all believers will be killed. Obviously, the ones who don't worship the image of the beast are going to be the believers. And they're not going to die, not all of them, because it is essentially in the kingdom of Christ after he returns and sets up his earthly kingdom that there will be people from every tongue and tribe and people and nation to populate the kingdom. Because it tells us clearly that all the nations will be represented uh, in the kingdom. So some will be spared. The Antichrist will not be able to find all the believers and execute all the believers. God will protect them. Secondly, there will be Jews who will be spared, rescued from this. We read about them very clearly in chapter 12. If you want to remember that in chapter 12, while the serpent comes after the woman who's in Israel, very clearly at the end of the chapter, verse 14 says God's going to provide a great eagle to take the woman and fly her into the wilderness and protect her for three and a half years out of the presence of the serpent. If you go to chapter 11, uh, you'll remember that there was a measuring rod and a measuring out of uh, protection and possession. And God again is saying there will be protection for people who belong to him, particularly there is in measuring out Jerusalem, one world power ruling the globe, one system of economic operation, one central controlling computer with the name of everyone. Likely no currency, credit completely takes over. Maybe instead of a card, you have a mark. Uh, maybe that mark on the forehead or on your hand. A man from Bulgaria under communism wrote some very interesting words. This is what he wrote. He said, quote, You cannot understand and you cannot know that the most terrible instrument of persecution ever devised is an innocent ration card. You cannot buy or sell anything except according to that little card. If they please, you can be starved to death. If they please, you can be dispossessed of everything you have. You cannot trade, you cannot buy, you cannot sell without it, end quote. The tragic testimony of this poor man caught in this communist takeover in Bulgaria. Devastating. There's a compelling reason to worship the Antichrist, not just spiritually, to live. That's the compelling reason. It's uh, people are going to have to make the choice. And in some cases, they're going to say to themselves, they don't have a choice. If they're not believers, if they don't believe in God, what strength do they have to avoid the beast, to avoid the mark? There's no reason why they would want to. Notice when they take this code, the mark, in the end of chapter 7, uh, verse 17, it says they can take either the name of the beast or the number on his name. It's very hard to interpret this. I don't know... Uh, you know exactly what this means. They have a mark and then it says literally the name of the beast or number of his name. It's an identification thing, a number system. The beast has a name, but inherent in this system is a number. 
impossible to know exactly what it is. But people in that day will take the mark and somehow it is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And John, in seeing the vision, may have as much trouble sorting or discerning this right now as we have. But then in verse 18, it said, here is wisdom. That is to say, people who are alive in that day need to be wise. I think that's the answer here. And you want to recognize what's happening. You want to be able to identify the number and the name uh, because we live in a world of numbers now. They're always giving us numbers and asking for numbers. People are all the time. How do we know that we're living in that time? We may be. And how does a person know living at that time what's coming to him is the Antichrist number? How does he know that? Well, here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate that number. Let him who has understanding calculate all of this. Apparently in some way, in that time, they can recognize him for something that looks to us like a complete mystery. But I'm confident that people will be able to figure that out in that day. The number 666. Now, it may reflect something of that when the Antichrist comes, his name will have some numeric equivalent that adds up to 666. People have based their study on this kind of thinking that they've given us so many things, we couldn't even recite them back. They have taken every conceivable personality uh, or of any predominance in the world that looks like it might be a potential antichrist and figured a way to make his number come up to 666. Everyone from the Pope, Martin Luther, depending on whether you're a Catholic or Protestant, or uh, some say John Knox, Napoleon, Hero, Hitler, Mussolini, I can go on and on. Uh, and a lot of people were sucked into that, and they're still trying to work it out. And I believe it'll only be in that day. People will gain that kind of wisdom that we can't have right now. But it is a number of a man. What does that mean? Is it a, what is the perfect number? Well, the perfect number we know is seven, right? It's, a, it, it's, it's fullness. It's all, it's perfection. That's God's number. Man's number is less than that. Man's number is six. A slave was forced to be free after six years unless he demanded to stay. Fields were sown for six years. Man was made on the sixth day. Six, 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 man, man, man. God's number is seven, the perfection, but the best we can come up with is six. He always falls short. The number represents human imperfection. And man, at his best, is the ultimate. All human power is only a six. He's never a seven. And so God has identified the final form of man's government in the world, just as 666. And somehow, that thrice repeated number of a man is much like the repeated statements about God. Holy, holy, holy. It's intended to reiterate the identification of man. God is holy, holy, holy. Man is 666. And somehow when this final Antichrist comes, there will be some way to identify him. So there's a warning to the whole world. You take that mark and you're going to receive the wrath of God. That's God's warning. And that's forever. You can make your choice. You can refuse the mark and get the wrath of Antichrist or you can take the mark and get the wrath of God. The wrath of God means torment with fire and brimstone. And it says in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. You take it, and you will suffer torment forever. So, chapter 19, what happens uh, specifically not to the deceived, but to the deceiving Antichrist and false prophet. Verse 20 of chapter 19, it says, And the beast was seized. And this is when the Lord returns. You have the picture of his coming, and the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs and, the, and his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And the two were thrown alive in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. 
And that's the end of the false prophet and the Antichrist. And I want to thank you for uh, watching and listening to this with me in part two of Revelation 13. And I hope that you stay with me for the rest of Revelation. And may God bless you.